Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session um, from Zach. What else can we automate? You will get very interesting tidbits from Zach. Uh, I've known him for some time. Very interesting content. So really excited to hear what he has to say this time and share with us. And with that, uh, Zach, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Anand. Um, I actually met Anand in uh, 2018 at the Selenium Conference in Bangalore. And that was the first time I ever gave uh, a talk in front of people. So uh, it's good to, to see you again. And thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I'll get into it. So you are here for what else can we automate, how to extend your skills and constantly be learning. A little bit about me. I uh, am a lead software development engineer in tests. I organize a Selenium uh, meetup group in Chicago. And I've been doing events like these for like three years and SDF for five years, et cetera. Here's all my links. Um, I'll also post these at the end of the presentation so you can uh, follow me. So the agenda for today, why I need to constantly be learning? I mean, you're at this conference, so you're probably know that you need to constantly be learning. <laughs> uh, and then I'll talk about how to use re rhetoric to pitch a new uh, technological idea to uh, your managers. That'll be the bulk of the presentation is uh, rhetoric and uh, it's exciting. <laughs> and uh, at the end, we'll, we'll go over some guidelines of, for that new technology. Once you've won your argument, you've won the right to implement something new. So first things first, why do you need to constantly be, be learning? Well. It is central to being a QA engineer. I mean, you are constantly testing new things. The software you are testing is changing constantly. It's being developed uh, constantly. And so that's literally part of your job is to, uh, to be learning. Um, but also just that in this ever evolving software landscape, you need to learn extra skills to stay relevant. Um, as a QA engineer, you wear a lot of hats and you're central to the team. So you might as well represent, you know, other interests uh, to, to that team. And uh, we all need to combat that stigma and the, the dev devaluation of software testing. Software testing is a critical role for, for all development work that happens. And, and you know, uh, we can combat that by gaining skills and holding our place in companies and uh, defending testing. Uh, I also think that you need to be constantly learning on, on the job. I think some skills can really learn, be learned best on the job. And learning on the job makes that learning interesting because your learning is instantly applicable and you, you get to practice you know, negotiation skills to even get to work on those things if they're not part of your core job. Uh, yeah, jobs are really the best place to learn. You, you know, yeah, you can learn in your off hours, but, but the best place to learn is you know, if you get you know, paid while you're doing it for your core job. Um, I also think that uh, being um, being a tester is kind of like uh, cooking, because <laughs> uh, like in cooking you have a recipe, and a, but a recipe is just a starting point. And really, cooking is a learned practice, and so is testing. Testing is a learned practice where you need to constantly be upping your skills. You need to test all your ingredients as you use them, and um, yeah, so cooking equals uh, testing for sure. So. That's why you need to be learning. Let's talk about uh, how to use rhetoric to convince people that you should be learning. So a lot of the rhetoric uh, in this presentation comes from this really great book. I recommend everybody reads it by uh, Jay Heinrichs. Um, and I want throughout the rhetoric walkthrough, these techniques, I, I want you to be thinking about how they can be applied to arguing for, you know, load testing, visual aggression testing, security testing, accessibility testing, et cetera. How can you take these arguments, these techniques and apply them to get uh, buy-in for these technologies? And um, just a side note, Aristotle and Socrates ideas comes in three. A lot of these ideas are older ideas, you know, Grecian ideas, Roman ideas, and, uh, they, they come in threes. It's pretty unique. All right. So let's describe a pitch. When you're pitching a new technology, uh, well, pitches in general work best in threes. You know, you want to stimulate the audience's emotions, change their opinion about something, and get them to act on something. Arguments uh, in uh, a few words are, are kind of a form of seduction. 
So you should start off usually with a story or something that appeals to someone's emotions that that kind of seduces them into the idea that you're that you're proposing. And your success rate, your success rate will go up drastically when pitching a new idea if you lead with something that affects emotions. Uh, it could be as simple as asking someone how their day was or about their weekends or building rapport. Um, it could be mentioning a hot button item at work. Uh, mentioned there was a big hit to the revenue for X, Y, and Z reason. You know, launch into a story that hits on those emotional buttons so that you can um, go into the next uh, topic and change their opinion and get them to do other things. Um, so when you're um, changing the audience's opinion, in this case, you're changing their opinion that the tech, these technologies aren't like superfluous. They're worth POCing. They're the kinds of things that um, it's worth it to prevent these things and have an automated solution to prevent them. So um, you want uh, the audience to get the sign off that POCing that technology is worth it. So there are three methods of persuasion kind of throughout those three steps. Uh, those are the logos, the ethos, and the pathos. And um, what, so you could say, the, yeah, stimulating the audience's emotions. I mean, that's a uh, probably an ethos or a pathos kind of argument. Um, when you're changing their opinion, you employ a lot of logos techniques, a lot of logical techniques to, to get to their uh, change their opinion. But you can also employ the other two uh, techniques. Um, Basically, these three techniques are interwoven in all, all the three steps. And um, I didn't mention it last slide, but um, I do have these uh, beautiful Roman sculptures in the background of each slide. Uh, so pay attention to those. So I described those kind of three um, methods of persuasion. There's also three tenses of arguments that can be uh, applied to arguments. So there's the forensic argument, um, it's concerned with blame. It takes place mostly in the past tense. You know, we could have prevented that bug if we had this testing in place. So that's, you know, looking at the past um, demonstrative argument. Uh, we want this test uh, to exist to identify with our values of uptime and stability. You know, those are our current values and um, that would be an argument that, that aligns with that. And then deliberative arguments are, you know, prescriptive, they take place in the future. This technology will save us X dollars. It'll prevent X amount of bugs. It'll prevent this amount of security breaches. And um, something that uh, the red rhetoricians tell us is that um, future arguments are often uh, the strongest arguments because they appeal to your sense of looking forward and they're mostly positive as opposed to, I mean, forensic arguments can work. It really depends on the person that you're dealing with, but um, but they do recommend going with future arguments. Um, that is a good tense to have an argument in. And you know you need to find the proper tense that works with your audience. Um, and another thing you can do is you can move tenses uh, from one from the past and then reconfigure it to the, to the present or the future. And that, that's another good technique. Um, all right, let's talk about the idea of concession. Uh, Concession is when you agree with an opponent's points, but still, you're still controlling the argument. Um, and it's about um, the best way to handle doing concession because con every argument has uh, concession points because that's how you know arguments happen with the exchanges with others. And uh, you'll the the best way to do it is to um, shift the discussion to definitions of terms and values when you're attacked. So if someone says, you know. We experienced a regression. You didn't do enough testing. You didn't test the right things. We need to be testing the right things when you, when you bring up bring up uh, one of these technologies. You know, you may feel attacked in that moment, but you can you can then agree and, and concede. But then you can move it to a discussion of values, like what what do we actually deem are the right things to test? Uh, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? What can we automate to make this not happen again to align with our values of stability? So again, I'm I'm framing that that uh, uh, negative, that forensic argument into a value argument and de defining the terms. The term being like, what do we deem are the right things to test? Um, it's all about when, when you're having concessions, try to get that argument to the future. And then you'll notice that I uh, conceded and 
uh, I started stopped giving uh, descriptions of these uh, Grecian busts because that's annoying. I actually got bored of it when I was making this presentation. So uh, this will be the future bust in the presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to warn against a kind of concession that uh, you shouldn't use. And uh, a lot of blogs might tell you that when you're presenting um, how to solve a problem, put your preferred solution in the middle. And for example, like let's say there's a security breach and you're like, all right, we have three options. Do nothing, build a security suite, or pay all this money for penetration testers. And since you put yours in the middle, I mean, it's, it's, it's cliche. You know, People will see through it. They'll see through that tactic. And I think that concessions work in a more of um, a human manner and like a, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I wouldn't use this kind of three framing of a solution to put yours in the middle. It's kind of overblown. So another really important part of negotiation is knowing your audience. And you want to match your language to your audience. If you're dealing um, with, with the product, um, you can mention these kinds of terms uh, because those are the terms that they deal in. And then they, you'll be able to um, uh, identify with your audience. And um, if the audience, if a product person is incredibly end user driven, I mean, you can use terms like user experience and um, you can construct arguments that will reflect how the end user will feel. And that will apply more to the, that product person because that's something that they empathize with. Um, same, like if you're talking to engineering managers, maybe, you know, code coverage, developer experience, pipelines, those are terms that, that work with them. So, so you use that kind of language. Um, when you're creating arguments uh, and you're having these negotiations with your managers, be aware of faulty kinds of reasoning. And I'm going to go over the kind of five really uh, common kinds of faulty reasonings. Uh, and that'll be the next five slides. So a false comparison. Um, basically, because one part of something is one way, the whole thing is that way. For example, if you see all natural on a food label, that's probably because there's one item in that uh, product that is natural. So they are so they just say that it's all natural because of that one item. And that's, I mean, not uh, strictly true to the informed consumer. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about security testing, uh, maybe your manager says, we don't need security, or sorry, not security testing. When you're talking about load testing, uh, maybe your manager will say something like, since the app, des app dex for the app is high, you know, all APIs are stable. We have a really good, uh, App decks. But the thing is, is that uh, this is an aggregate metric. So it's not, uh, you can still have issues with APIs uh, in an individual level, and that wouldn't show in this metric. So make sure, you know, do your research about the, the arguments that are being made with regards to these uh, testing uh, technologies. So the fallacy, the antecedent, that's assuming that because something worked in the past, it will continue to work in the future, you know? I don't need to slow down. I haven't had an accident yet. <laughs> That's you know not uh, strictly true. You can easily have accidents in the future. I don't need visual regression testing frameworks. I haven't had a visual regression test yet. Visual regression yet. Um, well, you could, and um, you know having a framework in place will will prevent it. So let's uh, be aware of that kind of thing. All right, the false choice. Uh, this is a fun one. It's uh, commonly like kind of pollsters use this this technique where they where they um, uh, they they put many questions uh, side by side. And so, like, do you support governed government finance abortions and a woman's right to choose? I mean, those are actually different issues. They're interrelated for sure, but they they can be thought of different aspects of um, a of a similar issue and one can agree with one and not the other and they don't need to go together. And um, it's it doesn't need to be a choice like that. Um, so, uh, you know, do you need acceptance testing to see if everything looks right and an expensive visual regression automated testing to verify the same thing? And it truly like they do different things. Um, acceptance testing, uh, you know, does a ton of different things and visual regression testing does one thing specifically really well and they're both related to quality, but they, they do it in a different way. So uh, I wouldn't say that they're equal choices. It's like five minutes. Thank you.
All right. I think my time is good. So, uh, so this is the fourth one, the wrong ending. So that's extrapolating a false conclusion from the evidence you're given. And another version of it's the slippery slope. So, you know, if we pull out of the worn hour, all our soldiers have died in vain. And yeah, that's a, a slippery slope in, in terms of arguments. And, uh, you know, an, uh, an analog to that is, you know, is if this new framework works, engineers are going to want to upgrade, react, like they're going to want to spend entire sprints on technical depth. They're going to want to do all the tech debt things. And um, I mean, it's not true. Uh, one does not uh, equal the other. Doing a small piece of tech debt doesn't mean that you have to do all the tech debt. Uh, last um, fallacy is the right way and the wrong way. And um, basically, uh, you know, avoid that kind of uh, argument style. It prevents further conversation and the other side might not feel heard or that the views are taken into consideration. So don't just say, you know, do the security testing because it's the right way to develop software. I mean, that doesn't go anywhere. Uh, so avoid that tactic. Um, so when you're having these negotiations, make sure to pick the best format. Uh, emails and Epic documents favor logic. Uh, Slack and instant messaging favors uh, pathos, which is your emotion. Yeah, Slack and instant messaging are very emotional platforms. So if you're kind of if you're making an emotional argument to a target that works with emotion, Slack might be the best format for that. And I think that uh, in-person or video chat favors ethos or the character. You can you can use you can be charismatic. You can use your character to um, convince them of that thing. Um, so, and there, obviously you can use a mix of these different things. But it's kind of cool to 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 notice how the different mediums um, have different characteristics like this. So, when you have your argument, um, you use data, bring up pain points, um, quantify them hours, dollars, reputation, et cetera, have a benchmark to compare to, have a plan to measure the effort, set metrics, et cetera. Uh, these are kind of the, that logos to bring to your argument. Um, so I have a little time so I can go run through an argument for a visual regression testing framework for adopting that at your company. So just as an example, we're going to stimulate the audience's emotions. So we're going to tell a story, maybe this story is about a respond button on a website and the end user can't complete their workflow and they logged off in frustration because of a visual regression. You know, they're, a, they're so used to that workflow. So when the button moved, they couldn't complete their workflow. So uh, now after that, I'm gonna try to change the audience's opinion on visual regressing technology. I'm gonna say it's easy to implement, it's cheaper than they thought. Um, they might say it doesn't align with our values because we value to move fast and break things. So like, why do we, need this framework that will uh, tell us that we're breaking things. And I'll, and I'll point out that that's a, a false choice argument <laughs> uh, because you can value moving fast and um, not, like just implementing a visual regression test doesn't mean you're not gonna break things. It just means you're not gonna break significant things in a significant way. So you point that out. Um, you can then get the audience to do or choose something, and that would be, you know, implementing a free tier to at least prevent the respond button uh, bug from happening. I'm not talking about implementing visual regression testing for the entire uh, for the entire application, just a small part, and it'll be free. And then I get to learn a new skill, which is visual regression testing. Voila, argument made. Um, so there's an accessibility testing one in here too. I'm not going to go over it because we're running out of time. Um, here's some just common stories that. Um, you know, or for that furthest part of the argument uh, that you could use. And, um, but really when, when you're trying to find stories, you can find them, you know, blogs, conferences, meetups, meetups or conferences like this are a great place to get stories so that you can go back to your companies and, and recant those stories for why you need to implement technologies. Definitely uh, reach out to your peers for those uh, horror stories. <laughs> um, and then when you finally uh, implement that, new testing technology, get it into a pipeline ASAP, uh, get the POC in front of all you can, make it easy to contribute to, uh, make, it people, make it easy for people to comp comprehend what's going on, set a time to reevaluate. Is it adding enough value? Do we still want it, uh, to use it? Who's responsible? Make sure there's a point person. What kind of insertions are placed? Could there be more? Is it instilling that quality that you promised? And there are some basic challenges to implementing a new technology that everybody's going to experience. And those are, it will take a bit of time to develop at first, and it won't have much coverage at first. 
and you will need to learn the hard lessons of that new type of technology. Every technology is not as simple as its README and its introduction and its getting started. There always are hard lessons to learn about that technology. And um, yeah, you might have to learn them, but give yourself some wiggle room when you're implementing it so that those hard lessons can be learned and then you can iterate and, and make it more rich. Um, and then you can also set a service liability agreement for yourself on how long that entire test suite takes to run and to develop and execute so that um, you're not uh, wasting everybody's time and the expectations are clear because that's the best thing uh, when you're arguing for these uh, technologies is make sure your expectations are clear on what they will deliver and what they won't deliver. Don't overpromise and under deliver. <laughs> so that's the presentation. Uh, I would love to talk about these topics uh, in detail uh, after in the hangout. And uh, here's where to find me. And that's the presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. And uh, again, for those who don't know, Zach has got up really early in the morning to help uh, to join us and share his thoughts with us. Very interesting techniques for sure. And the way the presentation style also, I really enjoyed that. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Anand.